Welcome everyone um, and thank you for joining us for our digital Q&A session with Robert Hollow. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you here from the traditional lands of the Ghana people and I recognise their connection to this land, waters and skies and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend those respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. My name is Tash and I'm a space communicator at the Australian Space Discovery Centre here in Adelaide. Today, our guest is Robert Hollow, joining us from, actually, where are you joining us from, Rob? Uh, I'm actually here at our headquarters for uh, CSIRO Space and Astronomy here at the, the appropriately named Marsfield in suburban Sydney. Oh, awesome. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Rob. Uh, so, uh, hi Tash, and uh, thanks very much to the Australian Space Discovery Centre for giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, share some um, ideas and information with you all around Australia today. Uh, so my name's Rob Hollow. I'm actually coming to you from the land of the Wallamatical people here in Sydney, so I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, and as the slide says, uh, my role is I'm the education manager for the Space and Astronomy uh, business unit within CSIRO. So that's quite a diverse job. Um, so tend to, it's a very interesting job. I do lots of different things. Um, but essentially, I um, manage uh, a lot of what we do in education and public outreach, uh, focusing on uh, astronomy and increasingly on the space side of what we do here in CSIRO. Uh, so I've been with CSIRO for 19 years. Uh, prior to that, uh, I uh, taught uh, physics and high school science here in New South Wales. Um, so I've had a fascinating time here in CSIRO. Uh, no two days are quite alike. Um, I manage our undergraduate students over the summer. So in fact, uh, Tash was one of our students last summer working up in Sydney on a project, um, um, uh, engineering project with us. Um, we have about 35 PhD students, we co-supervise them. We're not a university, so we don't give degrees, but we have students from different universities um, being co-supervised by our staff on a whole range of different projects. A lot of them in astronomy, but some in engineering and other things. Um, I run a variety of educational programs. So the main one I run is a thing called Pulse at Parks. And in fact, that's the one where, oops, if I move aside for a moment, uh, students get to use this amazing 64 metre Parkes radio telescope, uh, um, Murrayang, uh, to observe pulsars in real time and analyse their data. So in fact, this morning I was visiting a girls school in uh, Sydney, giving them a background talk and they're going to be controlling the telescope tomorrow uh, for two hours, getting um, uh, analysing these amazing objects called pulsars. I also do a lot of work with teachers. So in fact, I'll be down in South Australia in July for the conference there, running some workshop sessions for teachers, do those around Australia. And I do a lot of work around our telescope site in uh, Outback Western Australia, up at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. So I've worked with the Indigenous schools there um, and communities doing a range of work. Um, at this stage too, I also sit on, on a number of committees and represent CSIRO um, in a range of things. The other big project we're working on at the moment. I'm collaborating with colleagues at ANU and CSIRO colleagues down in Adelaide, and we're developing a new space education project that'll focus on space careers. And that'll uh, showcase a range of different career options um, and will include a lot of uh, uh, curriculum materials. And that'll all be online and free. We hope to have that at, uh, uh, by the end of the year. That's awesome. Um one of my questions was going to be, what does this, a day look like for you? But it definitely sounds well, like every single day is the, different. Every single day is different. As I said, I've uh, this morning I was at a school and that was great because, you know, for obvious reasons, haven't done much of that for the last few years. Yeah. So it's only the third school visit I've done in the last two and a half years. And that was fantastic because you do get the, lots of questions. So those girls were excited about coming in for our program tomorrow. Um, Lots of meetings, uh, lots of uh, sometimes you're doing grant, um, assessing grants. I sit in on um, one of the things we do is the International Astronomical Union has an Office of Astronomy for Development. So we get grant proposals in from around the world for people looking for funding to do um, 
using astronomy as the context to uh, help education and communities around the world, so all sorts of countries. Um, when I'm lucky, I get to go to some of our telescope sites, either to Parks or to um, Murchison in WA, come down to Adelaide, work with space agency and colleagues there. There's a whole variety of things. So no two days are necessarily the same. And that's, that's what makes it really interesting. And then there's that, you know, we've had over the last five years with the space agency forming, the new investment in space in Australia, all the exciting things that CSIRO are doing in space. It's it's really nice to sort of be in at the early stages of this and help contribute to something that'll hopefully have long term impact. One thing I noticed was that it almost feels like you you talk you work with a lot of people from a lot of different ages. So starting with high school students all the way to PhD students and, and of course all the boards you sit on. What's that like having sort of dealing with a lot of different people? Well, it's really interesting. In fact, I, I work in with uh, primary school uh, children. So CSIRO runs a STEM professionals in schools program, it has uh, scientists, engineers, mathematicians, not just from CSIRO, but from all sorts of organisations and pairs them with the school. And I've been really lucky the last year. I've actually been paired with my old primary school. So last year, for the first time, I got to go back to my primary school. I hadn't been back there for more years than I will mention. Um, and it's great to work with the students. And I'm literally doing that in the classroom that was brand new when I was uh, uh, you know, primary school. Um, but yes, it's, it's great because I get to work with high school students and that's my background as a teacher. Um, but it, it's, it's fascinating working with different stakeholders and different groups. And so working on these committees and you learn a lot from people from other countries, other situations, other locations. So work, you know, I think I'm, I'm very lucky in that I, as I say, I'm working with lots of different age groups and interest groups, and that's a, that makes for an interesting job. What do you think would, would be one of the most rewarding experiences you've had um, as an education manager? Uh, ultimately, as an educator, which I, you know, am deep down at heart, it's when you see that spark in a child's eyes, when they light up, when they realize that they've got this this other opportunity or something they didn't even know existed is a possibility for them and i think that's what's really exciting with what's happening in australia now in space yeah definitely um i think yeah, astronomy and space is an incredibly um rewarding field really um what about travel travel opportunities you talked a little bit about traveling into space oh, so yeah, so I've been very fortunate as part, of, I mean, I, I've always loved traveling, but um, one part of this job, because we're a national facility and we span Australia, I've been very lucky in that I've got the opportunity to travel all across Australia. So I've been to every state and territory in Australia as part of my job um, and also overseas. Um, so the Pulse of Parks program I mentioned, we run that in, oh, I think about 10 countries around the world. So we've literally traveled the world sharing our radio telescope with students overseas. So the photo that came up here, I was deliberately asked, these photos are actually only one of them's from a work trip. Um, the two at the bottom are really interesting. The one on the left is this amazing solar temple in northern Peru. And the one in the center at the bottom is probably recognizable. That's Machu Picchu. So I actually went on a, it was what we call a busman's holiday. It wasn't a work trip, but it was a holiday uh, archaeoastronomy tour of, uh, of Peru, so Machu Picchu and this temple here, just amazing place. We were the first tour group to ever go to this site on the left. Um, I love history and planes. I was uh, my last overseas trip pre-COVID. It was a work trip, but fortunately I had the weekend off and they had the giant air show up at Duxton, north of London. And on the left, I did a, um, uh, went to Greece uh, 12 years ago, and here I am in the, the famous uh, theatre uh, in, in Greece. So these ones here show a little bit more about my hobbies. So, I, you know, it's great to have a work-life balance. Um, I used to do a lot of sea kayaking, haven't done much recently. So the top left here, I am kayaking in an island off in the Hebrides in Scotland. And on the top right, um, beautiful place on the island of Milos in Greece. Um, the centre picture is a Dalek, which sort of reflects my geekdom and long love of, of Doctor Who and science fiction. And then the bottom left, my sort of other guilty hobby is wargaming, so recreating battles with model soldiers and the like. In the centre, that that helmet is the famous Sutton Who helmet. 
Um, so it's my love of history. Um, so that's in the British Museum and visited that several times. And then the last two was a few years ago when I was on a holiday, I finally got to fulfill a lifetime ambition to see the Royal Ballet. Uh, so I love theatre, I love ballet. So I was able to go and uh, see a few performances at the Royal Opera House there. So, you know, I, I've done some of the, you know, the travel of personal holidays, but I must admit that one of the fringe benefits of, in my role has been that I've gone to some amazing places for work. Um, the, the two most bizarre have um, been uh, to the very large telescope uh, in Paranal in Chile. Um, this is in the Atacama Desert. It's one of the best spots in the world for doing optical astronomy and there's four eight metre telescopes there. And uh, I was up there for a night. Um, it, it's quite amazing. And then the other place I probably never would have got to that work was Medellin, which is a city in Colombia, um, probably infamous from um, the um, Pablo Escobar uh, drug lord days. But um, we had a conference there for a week with astronomy communicators from around the world. It was a place I never would have gone to otherwise, but it was fascinating. And the people there were wonderful. They really looked after us and stunning country. So very lucky with that. That's so exciting and definitely shows how um, space can take you really around the world. Um, what actually is archaeology astronomy? So, so archaeology astronomy is, so astronomy is arguably the oldest science in that we actually have written astronomical observations. So on cuneiform or clay tablets, if we go to the British Museum, you can see these things are about 5,000 years old of observations of eclipses. But it goes back much further. And these days, you know, one of the things we've seen in the last few decades is much greater appreciation of indigenous astronomy around the world. So, you know, people have been looking up to the sky for tens of thousands of years. And now we have a greater appreciation of just how skilled our um, predecessors were around the world in studying the night sky and looking at it. And with archaeoastronomy, a lot of these things are not, they're not written records, but you've got, for instance, Machu Picchu, there's a solar temple. That other solar temple in um, northern Chile, they only actually figured out what it was a few years ago. And on that trip I went on, we actually had the archaeologist, Peruvian archaeologist who discovered it and cracked the, figured out what it was there as our guide. So that was fantastic. And indeed, even in Australia, north of, um, north of Melbourne, there are uh, stones laid out in astronomical alignment by the uh, Aboriginal um, um, group north of uh, Melbourne there. Yeah, I think yeah. sometimes we think of space and astronomy as something really modern, but it's fun to, to think about the history behind it. And if you're interested in history, um, the idea of becoming a, a space or astronomy archaeologist um, is very fun. Um, I also noticed, so you said you were a bit of a geek. You had that Dal Dalek picture. Um, yes. Is that part of the reason you decided to sort of work in astronomy or? Uh, partly, I guess. I mean, I was, I grew up in the 60s. Uh, you know, I watched the Apollo moon landing when I was in primary school. Um, so that was a big deal. So we were aware that, you know, space was the next big thing. There was lots of things happening. So it was an exciting time. And, you know, things like Doctor Who was a big part of my childhood. Um, so it's always influenced me. So I'd be, you know, and I used to read a lot of science fiction as a kid. I still read some, but it's, uh, um, yeah, it it broadens your mind. Yeah, I guess and it's also exciting that um, if you sort of grew up during Apollo, and then um, some of if we have uh, school students listening, we they're sort of living through the Artemis program. Um, so it's kind of fun that that's sort of parallel. Um, how, so you worked at CSIRO for, for 19 years. How has the space, and you, before that you were a teacher, how has the space and astronomy industry um, changed over time? So in Australia, we've always been really strong in astronomy. So where I work, we build and operate radio telescopes. We're one of the world leaders in radio astronomy. We've got a huge tradition of radio astronomy. Uh, Australia was, um, you know, involved early on in space, but I think it's probably fair to say we we really weren't, you know, at the forefront for several decades. But in within the last ten years, things have really flipped, uh, and we've seen that, you know, obviously the foundation of the Australian Space Agency, um, and you know, Australian Space Discovery Centre, um, and you know, in CSIRO we we've, we've um, Followed, not followed along, we've been uh, along with the ride. So our involvement, our expenditure, investment in space 
research, space industry, um, research programs has, has significantly increased in the last five years. So we are working on a whole range of different uh, challenges and projects. Uh, be it from, you know, we for many decades we've been, well, for many years we've been involved in deep space tracking communication. We run the NASA Centre at Canberra and we also operate the European Space Agency's dish north of Perth. So the, um, but now we're um, looking at, we have our Centre for Earth observation, we have shares in the Novasar satellite, we're a key partner in the plan for four major new satellites. We're also experts in what you do with the data. So the satellites are just a means, you know, of themselves, they're not important. It's the data or the facilities or the technologies that they give you that are the really important thing. And so we've got real strength and expertise in how you um, manage that data, what you can do with it and make it available, not just to us, but you make it available to as many people as possible. So be it to farmers monitoring drought or um, you know, emergency services in terms of bushfire or hurricane or flood uh, management and the like. So I guess sort of, yeah, in the last five years, everything has really amped up. I, I definitely noticed that too. Um, if we're talking sort of in the next 10 years, what do you think um, the future of Australia in space will look like in, say, 2032? So... I mean, the plan is we want to triple the size of the space industry in Australia, and we're, I think we're on track to, do, to get a lot of that going. Um, I mean, today's, you know, driving to the school this morning, the news was about NASA launching three scientific uh, rockets from up in the Northern Territory. Um, so these are doing, you know, astrophysical observations and sounding in suborbital rocket launches. So that will be great. So we're, you know, regaining um, launch cap capacity here beyond what we've done uh, with Woomera. Um, I think we're looking at the fact that well, what's really exciting is that space now isn't just, you know, these big multinational companies. I mean, they've still got a vital role to play with things like Boeing and Airbus and, you know, things like Microsoft and that. They've all got a vital role. but. And we see it in Australia, we see it in Adelaide, we're seeing it in, in most of this, uh, in all the states around Australia, innovative new companies um, coming up with new ideas and ways of doing things a little bit different to what we've done before um, and coming up with really creative solutions. So we're seeing new, um, new launch facilities, new, new technologies, uh, Internet of Things, the whole range of things. And so it's a really exciting time. And, and it's a time where, you know, the demand for people in this industry is really growing. So these companies, they're all in the process of, you know, seeking out staff uh, across a range of skills and disciplines. Yes, I think sort of the lowering cost barrier to, to space has been really exciting. I think all these companies, um, startups have been fantastic. Um, what do you think are some of the challenges um, that Australia or maybe the world will face um, in space? So, I mean, space isn't easy um, and, you know, whenever you're pushing um, technologies, you know, there will inevitably be things that don't work. Um, hopefully they're not fatal, they're, you know, but you, if you don't take those risks, you're not going to really uh, go to the next stage. I think with the setting up of the space agency and with um, what we've been doing in CSIRO, and with some other, you know, similar sort of stakeholders, there's been an awareness that look, Australia, we've sort of coming in a little bit late after, you know, being fairly complacent for a while. Um, and we can't do everything. You know, we are a nation of 25 million people. We've got a lot of very talented and skilled people here, but we've got to be very sensible and smart about what we're doing. And I think we've achieved that. I know the space agencies worked hard at that. CSIRO, we've got our space roadmap that identified where are the areas in space and the space industry that we can make a real difference and have a real impact? Um, so, you know, we're not looking at producing the world's biggest rockets to launch. That's not where our strength is going to be. But, you know, we are a major player, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, um, where we've got all sorts of opportunities for um, in Earth observation, um, environmental monitoring and the like. And I think ultimately we're going to see that Perhaps we end up actually talking less about space because it's actually just normal. It's integrated to what we do. 
So yes, we will have satellites and we need and we'll have more of those and they'll be doing some really interesting things. But they'll be linking to, you know, um uh drones, uh in situ sensors on the ground. So it's just one integrated whole monitoring our environment and you know, so that we can make better decisions and the like. Yeah, sort of almost normalizing the space industry. Um, yes, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's not to say it's not exciting. It'll always oh, be yes. exciting, it'll always, always be challenging. <laughs> but but yes, it's just, I mean, I, I when I give public talks, I always start um, my talk with two questions, uh, you know, a question to the audience. And I say, you know, who's used space today? And you see people, you know, some people are very puzzled. And the fact is, we pretty well all, all use space every day already. We check the weather, um, you know, uh, we use GPS. These are integral parts to our modern way of life. Yes, definitely. Um, sort of related to um, sort of the accessibility of space um, and getting people into space. What does, um, and in your role as education manager, what does sort of diversity mean to you? Um, and how have you seen that in the space industry? So what we know, all everything shows you, if you've got a very homogeneous workforce, that is all the people have the same background, same education, same age, whatever, you're going to get a very homogeneous output. It's not going to be the best, right? Diversity means many things. You want people at different levels of career progression from different backgrounds, from different educational pathways, um, with different skill sets and different abilities, um, different ways of thinking, um, because the more you can draw those people together, the better the outcomes. And so we as an organisation are taking that very seriously, and I know other groups are too. Um, and we're always trying to reach out to underserved communities and try and you know, ease the pathways for people that traditionally wouldn't have thought that it was even possible to think about a career in space um, to do that. I mean, not not disparaging, uh, you know, the, the obvious attainment, but a lot of people, when you ask them what they think about a career in space, they think you've got to be an astronaut. And yes, there are some astronauts, but yeah, the number of astronauts is very, very small compared to the, num the huge number of people working in the space industry. And, uh, you know, and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work in the space industry. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have those, but you need um, space lawyers, you need people in space medicine, you need your project managers, you need your engineers, your technicians. You actually need people with a range of skills that you would get through TAFE. So if you're building these things, you have specialist skills, for instance, in welding or construction. So, you know, you don't have to go to university to end up in a space career. Uh, there's a whole different range of pathways. And that's one of the things we're working through at the moment. So. If, um, SmartSat Cooperative Research Centre has done a um, um, skills mapping and we're looking at what's needed for the training for the workforce and it encompasses obviously things like you know what sort of research degrees and everything but down to or well not down to but working with other groups say at the TAFE sector what are the new trade courses we need to give people the skills that they're going to need to um, make a contribution in, in the space industry. Yes, I definitely echo your point in that um, there's lots of different pathways and it doesn't necessarily have to be astronaut or even university um, at sort of in the space discovery centre. Sometimes people ask me, do I, do, you, do I need to go to uni to get a job in space? And that's not true. Um, you talked a little bit about the, the non-university skills that are definitely needed. Um, what advice would you give to someone who's heard this and thinks, oh, I want to get invo involved in space, um, who wants a space career? So, well, I think the good news is, unlike if I was giving this talk 10 years ago, I think it's a very realistic and totally viable career option now here in Australia. Uh, there, obviously, there were people working in it back then, but there's some far more opportunity now. So I think any of you online who are at school, you're, you're well placed to, to be thinking about this. I guess it depends, obviously, what sort of you know pathway you are talking about. I mean, if you're aspiring to something like, like being a, a rocket scientist or at the sort of the, the real forefront of the technology, then, you know, look at taking your higher level science subjects at school, your strong levels of maths. The other thing I think you can really look at, and it's a skill that I know my colleagues here in space and astronomy are always looking out for, is people with coding skills. These days, in fact, the other, the second question I ask the public is where is the value to be had in space? And the value to be had in space isn't in launching a rocket. 
yeah, a rocket is just a means of getting a satellite up to do a job. But the, the real value from space comes from the data and the information that we get. And so you need to be able to handle that data. And the new sensors, they are new telescopes here on Earth, our radio telescopes particularly, but also our sensors for Earth observation out in space now are vastly more sensitive and powerful than previous generations. Trade-off is they're producing vastly more data. And so very much these days in this field, we're looking at how can we manage, interpret, and make sense of data. So I think if you're in a position to do some coding skills, um, something like Python, there's lots of good online courses you can do, some free ones there to teach yourself coding if it's not done at school. Um, that's setting you up well just for being flexible in how to manage and think of, you know, how we manipulate and use the data and, and get useful information out of it. Yeah, so, um, yeah, coding is a very important skill. Um, what about, you sort of have a, had a very unique career path um, and almost felt, feels, feels like you've almost forged your own career. What was that like? Uh, you, you should possibly slightly correct. So, in fact, my career path is even more, a little bit more unusual than I mentioned at the start. So, I didn't actually uh, go straight from school into uni into teaching. I actually was joined the army. So I was um, uh, doing officer training in the army. And that's in fact where I did my physics degree. Um, and then when I got ill, I left the army and I um, uh, went into teaching. So that's there. And then when I was teaching, I was actually doing a lot of astronomy outreach while full time teacher. And then eventually we had uh, a new university open up near me and I was, wanted to get back into astronomy more fully. So I started doing an astronomy research degree part time while teaching. But I sort of realised there was probably people that were going to be better as, you know, academic astronomers than me. Um, but there wasn't anybody really doing much in the way of astronomy education. And then at the time there was an opportunity. I, there were, you know, it's funny how things happen. Um, in New South Wales, they created a course on um, a distinction course on cosmology and they wanted a couple of teachers to help write it. So I applied and got onto that. And then at the same time, um, uh, I noticed that in the science teacher, they had these fellowships in those days to go overseas and study something. And I just started my astronomy degree. I was doing this cosmology. So I put in, you literally had to put in a two page initial proposal. I put that in and then I was going overseas to a conference in New Zealand um, my first astronomy conference and they had a teacher workshop the day before and I was running late. It was in suburban Christchurch. I got into the conference. I sat down and they introduced the key, the keynote who was uh, Sir Patrick, um, uh, a more famous British amateur astronomer and author. And then they introduced the person next to me, Professor John Percy. And then they introduced me because they figured I was important because I was from Australia and I knew nothing. But I was chatting to this John Percy next to me and he Turned out he was the president of the Commission for uh, Astronomy Education for the whole of the International Astronomical Union. And I said, oh, I just put in this scholarship application. He said, well, if you get it, come and visit me. And so he gave me some advice. I went back, I found I've been shortlisted. And so using his contact, I was able to put together a nice proposal, got it. And so I went and visited him in Canada and then he sent me down, got me to, down to visit colleagues at Harvard. And then we went over to the UK. So I guess the thing from that is that serendipity is part of it. You've got to be prepared to put yourself out there a little bit. Um, a lot of how I, where I've ended up is because you have that conversation, you strike up that conversation with somebody and you follow through and don't be afraid to say, well, you know, what about this? And so I was very lucky early on that I had some very good mentors and people that helped me. And at the stage of my career now, I guess one of the things that I uh, really enjoy is being able to, you know, give some advice or mentor or help um, networking um, younger people coming through that might want a, a career path in astronomy education or you know space careers and education and outreach so that's 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 something that I, I really value these days. Yes yeah, so in terms of building your own career I definitely detected a lot of open-mindedness throughout your whole uh, your whole career yes. and also knowing your strengths yeah. was another one. Um, yeah, so I was able to pivot a bit. I sort of saw, you know, there was a, a gap there. I mean, when I was doing that for many years, I was just doing it while teaching. I didn't think there'd be a job in it. And in fact, the last school I moved to, 
um, the, the headmistress there said, oh, where do you see a career? And I said, oh, I'll probably apply for head of science because I knew the head of science was going to retire in a year or two. And, said, and then I jokingly said, and if CSIRO ever had a astronomy education job, I'd go for that. And then two and a half years later, suddenly I get this job advert. So I remember when I asked her to write the reference for me leaving, she laughed when she saw the ad. So it's said, oh, you know, so that was, you know, yeah, it was nice. But I had been working with CSIRO before they created the position, sort of running, you know, helping with uh, workshops and the like. Mm. Um, I think since we've only got 15 minutes left, we should move on to some of the questions from our audience. Um, so, um, Sienna had a question, which is, what is your favourite satellite in space? Oh, look, I don't know. I think at the moment I'd have to say Novasar just because it's, uh, the one that we here in CSIRO have a ten percent share in, so it's a synthetic aperture radar. It's a British-built satellite, um, and basically, it's a radar. So it can beam down. It operates day and night. Can look through cloud and everything. And it, we now operate it as a offer it as a national facility for researchers and people across Australia to get data. And I, my colleagues here at CSIRO do a great job managing that and making the data available. So that's my current one, but I think there's going to be lots more new ones going up soon. Yes, absolutely. Um, so Samia had a question, which is what opportunities exist within the CSIRO? So uh, for control CSIRO, systems, sorry? sorry, for control systems, uh, AI, machine learning professionals specifically. So at the moment, I'm uh, uh, also a team leader. So I manage a group of several what are called postdocs uh, and some other staff. So postdocs are generally their first or second um, job out of finishing their PhD. So they're, they're professional astronomers early in their careers. And one of them, in fact, I was having a, a chat with her just before this in my office, and she works on machine learning. So we have major machine learning uh, projects across CSIRO. They had a big meeting in Sydney last week where across all sorts of dis disciplines. So, you know, machine learning is big in astronomy. It's big in agriculture. It's big in all sorts of different things because as I've pointed out, the data rates now are so great that we're at the stage where realistically humans can't, you know, physically inspect all the data. So we need to develop better tools for helping us interrogate the data. So we have lots of uh, positions for researchers and people working in projects across a whole range of machine learning activities. We also have um, within our Centre for Earth Observation, we've got people now, we've got um, some of my colleagues working in satellite operations, systems engineering for satellites and the like. So, Yeah, I actually remember um, on my summer placement, one of the projects was uh, machine learning for detecting aliens. Um, so I think that would be a really fun opportunity to pursue. Um, Shania had a question which was, what would you recommend as the next step for a soon-to-be graduate in a Bachelor of Science specialising in Earth systems to start their career in space, the space industry, specifically in Earth observation? So that's going to be a, a, a growing field here in Australia. So I would, if, I'd recommend you go and have a look at our CSIRO Centre for Earth Observation page. Um, so we've got a team of people now specialising that. I know they run, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Amy Parker has run, uh, been running workshops in it. We know, we know we need to train up a bigger workforce on um, using Earth observation data and linking with, you know, and managing the satellites to get the Earth observation. So have a look at that and um, that would be a way. And keep an eye out for some of these uh, workshops that are running for graduates or postgraduates. Uh, and we know that this across the whole field, there's a, a much greater demand for um, realistic or appropriate training at all sorts of levels. Sort of related to that, um, that question about careers, um, what are the main locations that the CSIRO Space and Astronomy, Astronomy offices are? And does it really matter which state you're in? Um, would it require relocating? So we we have a very flexible um, approach to work here in CSRO, obviously more so over the last couple of years. We have our major sites. So our headquarters for space and astronomy is here in Sydney. Um, we've got staff based at our telescopes at Parks and at Narrabri and quite a large number of staff, obviously, at the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex. 
our other major site, we've got a, a large number of people based in Perth. We have some people at New Norcia, about an hour north of Perth at the space tracking site there. A growing site at Geraldton, so um, on the uh, western coast uh, up from Perth, uh, there to support our telescopes inland. And that's going to grow significantly because inland WA, we're going to have the SKA Low, which will be the world's largest radio telescope. And we're the host partner for that. It's a billion dollar multinational collaboration. So we're recruiting hundreds of people over the next few years for that. But we have other of our staff based in, we've got um, some of our space people working on space stuff down in Adelaide. Um, the actual uh, the manager of our overall space program in CSRO, Dr. Kimberly Clayfield, is based in Brisbane. So, you know, there are, um, we have, we're geographically dispersed. Um, Obviously, we have centres where the bulk of our people are, but it sort of depends on what your job is as to where you may be based. But with many of our jobs these days, they provide a range of you know physical locations as options. Yeah, I think one of the benefits of the pandemic has been a bit more flexibility regarding locations. Um, I've got a more fun question, um, which is, uh, do you think that we will find life outside Earth in your lifetime? So two parts to that. So there's so life outside the uh, Earth. I think it, it, you know it's a no-brainer. There will be life elsewhere in the universe and even within our galaxy and probably nearby in our galaxy. Maybe even in our solar system, possibly Europa. Who knows? I think with the technologies with future telescopes planned, we will soon be getting pretty good detections of what we call biosignatures. So if you're taking, if you're able to obtain the spectrum of the atmosphere of an exoplanet, planet beyond our solar system, and you, for instance, were picking up large amounts of oxygen, you know, um, some oxygen, or you're picking up something like um, chlorophyll in there, you know, these chemical compounds, these are what we would call biosignatures. So I think that's, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd lay money on that one. The second question, of course, is the even bigger one, and that is, will we find intelligent life? Uh, so-called search for extraterrestrial intelligence or aliens for want of a better word. And in fact, I've actually um, been part of a program that's been doing that for the last five years. The Breakthrough Foundation in America that was sort of funded by the Silicon Valley billionaires has been funding um, science that's beyond the normal sort of science funding. And one of the projects they set up was Breakthrough Listen. It, initially, it was a $100 million project over five years. And as part of that, they wanted time on different radio telescopes around the world. So they paid for a significant chunk of time on our Parkes telescope, uh, Mariang, for, for the five years. And I've been part of that project. So I've been fortunate. I've actually got over to Berkeley to where they're based, the headquarters there, and met with the team there a couple of times. Um, seeing as this is um, uh, a really enthusiastic bunch, I can share a secret with you if you want to know how many aliens we've found so far. Uh, the answer is none, unfortunately. Um, but we're looking and we've, um, we're getting a lot of data and we're refining the techniques. And, you know, realistically, we've still only looked at a tiny patch of, of our galaxy. Um, but with these new programs coming on, we're going to be able to see a lot more new telescopes coming on. And I mean, that's, that's exciting because, you know, let's face it, e even if we find just primitive, you know, cellular life beyond um, Earth, that's a huge discovery. If we find intelligent life beyond Earth, uh, that's an absolute game changer. That will be the biggest scientific discovery ever. Yeah, that would be absolutely incredible. Um, you mentioning Parks reminded me of something you said at the beginning of um, the interview, which was um, you were going to get uh, a school to control Parks. And I think uh, before I knew a little bit, bit about Parks, that would have really confused me because how can you control a massive telescope um, like that? Um, wouldn't it be really complicated? So, yeah, it used to be that you had to sit in the control room at Parks in the tower. And, you know, when I first started observing, that's what you'd do. You'd sit there and be there for hours and whatever. Um, about eight or nine years ago down, we did a major upgrade. So, in fact, all of our radio telescopes are all now designed for full remote observation. So most of the time, there'd be nobody actually sitting in the telescope at Parks. We have staff on site for maintenance and the like. But I can, you know, if I've got the allocated time on Parks, I can um, control it from anywhere in the world. As I said, so our Pulse at Parks program, which is the education program which the students are going to be doing tomorrow, we 
we've had over 200, well over 200 sessions. We've taken it to be 10, 10 or more countries around the world. Uh, and we, we can observe from anywhere. And that's what makes it really flexible these days. You know, it used to be romantic in some ways that you go out to the telescope. It is in a lovely setting. You're sort of away from things. You can't have your mobile phone on so nobody can annoy you. And, and it's great. But, you know, it's a big commitment in time. You're away from, your, you know, got your travel time. You're away from your family. And so it's, you know, it's a commitment. Now we can, you know, with I, we can be part of a program and you might have 10 collaborators and they might be in four countries around the world. And because our telescopes, the radio telescopes can observe during the day and the night, you know, you can have somebody scheduled in that's going to just observe in their normal office hours rather than having to get up at 2 a.m. I mean, occasionally you still get the 2 a.m. one, depending on what you're looking at or whatever, but it's very flexible. Uh, and it's all these days all run through a web browser. We've got these amazing tools and technology, so it really makes it much easier to collaborate. And, and you know, in our case, we were well placed then when COVID hit. Um, prior to that, students would come to our headquarters here to do it. Now we run it for schools across Australia online. So tomorrow I've got two Sydney schools and a Perth school coming online for the same session and they're all collaborating together. Yeah, that but we do we do hope to come down and run a one one or two down in the, the space discovery center yeah, yes, in the not too distant definitely. future i'll be i'll be the first one in the class you will indeed tash yeah. <laughs> uh, we only have two more minutes left so i had one more question which is what sort of advice would you have for your younger self um sort of as you oh began? okay i'm not sure well i guess don't be afraid to ask questions don't be afraid to you know try and network. I think networking is underrated and very important. So one thing I did say earlier when we talk about, you know, study options and, you know, or coding and everything. The other thing that I missed out and the other thing that comes up very important as a skill that you need these days is that and the terms a bit ghastly, but the soft skills, it's the ability to work in groups. It's the ability to communicate, to get up like this, give a talk, share your ideas with people and collaborate and work in teams. Those are essential skills because all this stuff I've talked about in you know programs I run, I don't just do them alone. Well, you're always working in a team, and you need to acknowledge people's expertise and not be afraid. So, well, I don't know that. Can you help? Or what? You know, who do we need to go to to help solve this problem? Yeah, I definitely echo that. Well, thank you so much um, for joining us today, uh, Rob, and for sharing your story. And thank you for everyone who has listened. Um, it has really been fantastic. Um, if you'd like to learn more about space in Australia or how to become a space expert, um, come and visit us at the Australian Space Discovery Centre. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.